where advanced concretes are competitive and two examples of success cases. In, 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 in this talk, I, I called advanced concrete to ultra high performance fiber reinforced concrete, which is a very special concrete. And you may wonder why, why we are speaking about this if this is a, a self-healing project, okay? Um, I think there are, some uh, there are some similarities between both technologies. First, because uh, both innovations are very novel in a very conservative sector, construction sector, uh, but also because uh, self-healing technology may be a, a, a substitutive product uh, of UHPC technology or upside down. They are not competitors, but they may be substitutive. Both may be used in, this, in the same fields, in many cases with water, with durability problems. Uh, so I think it's very interesting for you to understand how this technology has been deployed in the market, because then uh, it could pro give you ideas about how to proceed with your, with your technology. Well, we are going to speak about what is UHPCRC, UHPC in general, the current market of this technology, uh, some potential competitive applications, the two success cases, uh, uh, the floating farms uh, and also pontoons for floating photovoltaic plants, and a few tips uh, to success in this sector. Well, first, what is ultra high performance fiber reinforced concrete, what we generally call UHPC? In general, we can describe it as a cementitious material that has more than 150 megapascals of compressive strength, which has fine aggregates, a high fiber content to have a, a thoughtness, ductility in tensile, uh, in, in tensile loads, and a very low water binder ratio. This is a general description of what is UHPC, which is normally a self-compacting material, okay? Uh, if we follow the French norm, which is the most known, the, it's not the only one, but is the most widespread norm uh, in the world, uh, they consider that UHPC has, should have more than 150 megapascals of characteristic strength in compression. This, um, uh, in the current moment of the technology, seems too much because uh, what's really, what is most important in this material uh, is generally the, uh, the durability parameters, both in, uh, both in cracked and in uncracked state. In uncracked state, this norm, as you can see in the bottom part, states a water porosity, a diffusion coefficient chloride, and a an, uh, permeability to gas uh, parameters, these three parameters. And in many cases, you may have a UHPC which does not have 150 megapascals of characteristic strength in compression, but which has this durability, which fulfills these durability requirements. And then it can be used for all the applications uh, where we are using UHPC. For this reason, uh, many of the new norms or, or the standards that are already launched or on progress already uh, set that uh, the, the minimum strength, the characteristic strength uh, under compression should be between 120 and 130. This is very interesting because it opens a little bit uh, the capacity to use um, to, to use this technology uh, in, in many in many different applications. Why? Because in the end, producing a USB-C with 150 of characteristic is much more expensive than 120 in characteristic, and the application could be very similar. Okay, so the trend the trend also for the European future guideline that we will have in few years is 150 of average, more or less, and 120 of characteristic strength. Well, it's very, very relevant for me to highlight uh, what are the, the properties of UHPC, which are uh, something that sometimes we confuse with the advantages, okay? UHPC has what we call a high compressive strength. It is high because we like to compare it with ordinary concrete, but it would be very low if we compare it with steel. So in the end, it's a property. It's not an advantage, okay? UHPC has a high compressive strength compared with ordinary concrete, a high tensile and bending strength compared with ordinary concrete. It has high corrosion capacity, high impact and abrasion strength, and so on, okay? Currently, the price, uh, it, the price is also a property, but it's true that as this, the price of the steel has increased dramatically in the last months, the price is currently an advantage compared with steel. So these properties, uh, has certain consequences in the structure. And this, uh, these are the advantages. This is what we would explain to a client 
uh, we, I, I, when I speak with someone about a potential application, I don't explain them. It has a very high tensile strength. They don't mind this. What they mind is if they can design something that is lighter or that is more economic or that they save money in transportation costs, okay? In general, this is also what we explain when we try to promote with this, for example, this infographics to promote the use of 2HPC, depending on the sector where we are trying to promote it, we, we explain the different advantages that they, they will really appreciate in offshore environment, the corrosion strength, the impact strength, the capacity uh, in industrial sector, the durability, okay? So as you can see here, the first two advantages, high lifespan, so higher uh, lifespan of the structure and low maintenance costs. So these are durability advantages. But we can also design structures that are up to 70% lighter than ordinary concrete structures and which weight may be very similar to, a steel, to the weight of a steel structure, okay? So we can design lighter structures. And this implies also this implies that we can redesign the structure sometimes because it has a low, a smaller uh, dead weight, but also we can reduce the transportation and commissioning costs. And as you will see later, this may imply a, a really, a really relevant saving in the in the capex, in the first expense uh, that you do in a in a structure. And finally, with this material, we can design more slender structure. So more beautiful structures and also structures with a higher surface quality. And this implies an advantage in terms of, of aesthetics or architecture, okay? If you consider these three advantages, we, you can plot it, you can plot them in this kind of diagram that you can see here, where, where I think, this is something that we have uh, done in, in our company, I think that you can set here, you can, draw here all, all the competitive applications with UHPC because sometimes you use it because it's very durable or because you need a high durability that no other material can provide. Sometimes because, because with them you can do a lighter structure that uh, with, others, with others materials you couldn't do them or because they provide a particularly relevant aesthetics. It's important to notice that in the, in the bottom part, okay, in the part of the aesthetics or architecture, uh, this is a value that the client perce perceives immediately, or you like it or you don't like it, okay? It's something subjective, but the decision is uh, done at, in the moment, okay? For example, in the case of these stairs, uh, the client looks, looks at the design and they, they say, yes, I want it. And they are able to pay for more simply because it's not a question of cost. Okay, they appreciate more value in this. It doesn't mean, in this case, that these stairs are not durable or light. What I mean in this plot is that what uh, the reason that makes that the client accepts, the client purchase this or, and decides for UHPC is not the durability or the lightness, is the aesthetics, the aspect. In, in this part, in the part of the lightness, normally it is very, it is, uh, the analysis is clear, it's not a subjective decision, it is objective. You can make the numbers and you can justify and explain that the, the investment of the, in this structure is lower, so the structure is more economic due to the weight. Later we will see an example of this. So the decision is also very immediate. I don't need to convince uh, my client to purchase something because I can, I can simply uh, provide a more, uh, a, a more competitive offer because the structure is lighter, so I provide the price and they accept. But in the top part, the durability, it's more difficult. It's true that we could, if we were able to justify the real durability, we could do it objectively. It's not a subjective thing. It, it lasts 40 or 50 or 60 years, but normally we can only prove it at long term, uh, as, as you already know, because you are working on that. So uh, it is very difficult to show, to demonstrate that uh, a structure uh, is going to be more durable. And I have met some of you, of the, of the students, of you. Uh, sometimes you explain to me uh, that self-healing concrete is better because uh, it increases the durability, because the lifespan will be longer. And I, I, I would like to ask you, when in your life you do purchase decisions depending on the durability? When you buy your car, you don't ask 
will it last longer than the other brand of car? When you buy your mobile phone, you don't decide your purchase depending on the durability of, mobile, of your mobile phone. In fact, you know that your phone will last one year and a half or two, and even though you buy it. So you, sometimes you pretend that, that your client pays for something that will last longer, but you never do it in your personal lives, and me neither, because we, we pay something if we like it or if it is cheaper, but not considering that it will last long. So it's very, very, very difficult to convince someone to pay more promising that it will last more, okay? Only in cases like here, like this is that, that we will explain cases where the durability, you feel it really at short term, at three, four, five years. Then uh, in the structure, it's really worth to pay for more. So an example of, uh, of uh, some application, the use of this kind of uh, diagram, um, you can see here some of them. For example, this is an industrial application. Few, uh, few months ago, we repaired a tower of 52 meters height, which was submitted to uh, changes of temperature, vibrations, impact, and so on. So it's an, a clear example of a durability problem. The client doesn't pay for the aesthetics, obviously, and lightness is slightly relevant because the thickness of the amount of material that you use depends, it affects. So uh, this application would be here, close to durability and with a little bit of lightness advantage. In the case of the footbridges, this is a footbridge we, we installed a few months ago. Uh, the three of them are relevant. Uh, you have water close in this and in many other, so it's a, uh, it's a corrosive environment somehow, so that's why it has part of durability. The, the lightness is relevant also because you can transport it in a single track and install it directly. If it, wa if it was an ordinary concrete footbridge, uh, you couldn't do it, so lightness is relevant. And aesthetics also, because in the end, you convince the client because they like it. Eh? So the, there is uh, the influence of the three of them. In the case of precast housing, for example, this is a swimming pool uh, we did a um, few months ago. The client is paying because they like the structure, okay? Aesthetics, that's the, the value they perceive, but it is only possible to do this structure, which is a cantilever of 12 meters long, because it's USB-C, because with ordinary concrete, you cannot build this, okay? So the real advantage is in the lightness, okay? So you always need to wonder in which of these three parts or a combination of them you are. Okay, what is the current situation of UHPC in the market? Is the market growing or not? Well, in general, you can divide it in two parts. Uh, what I call um, aesthetic UHPC, okay? Normally, it's a white UHPC that is used to do architectural elements. It's, it's more fine. The, the, the mechanical capacity is not that relevant, and it's mainly used to do facade panels, okay? Ductal is, uh, Ductal is the, the brand of, of Lafarge, of UHPC, and they have a lot of applications here. They have also here, but mainly in this part. And in the, in the part of the structures, uh, so a structural use of UHPC, there are um, basically, Hycon is the largest company in Denmark. They are growing and building many balconies, and now they are entering also in the structural, in the, in the stairs uh, sector. Uh, Dura, a Malaysian company, is doing hundreds of bridges in their country with UHPC. Uh, they have specialized very much. And uh, a very significant application that is growing a lot in the last years is the application of thin overlays for cold uh, regions made of UHPC. This is something uh, widely used in Switzerland, as you can see in this map, and in the US also for joints between precast elements uh, in, in bridges. Uh, we are also here, our company Prefor is here. We are not so big as these companies, but it's true that uh, we have done a, a, a significant variety of applications with UHPC. And, and I will explain who we are in this sense and to explain these two uh, success cases of uses. Uh, well, we are a team uh, working with UHPC since 2010. Uh, we started in the university with Professor Pedro Serna, which, which spoke uh, before. And our first application was, was designed by my mate, Juan Angel Lopez. It's the, it was the, the first uh, World Trust footbridge made only with USB-C. 
is the one that you can see in the picture. It has a span of 45 meters. And officially, we founded the, uh, the, the engineering company in 2015, RDC, and a precast company where we produce all these elements in 2018. Uh, our goal in the end is to search and to find competitive applications with UHPC and try to shape these new sectors. So normally this material requires that you identify something new and that you, that you build it. Normally it's, it's very difficult that you try to enter in a sector that already exists because this material is very new. So considering this, uh, I will explain the first success case, the floating UHPC farms, which uh, we launched to the market to solve a need. What was the need? Well, this, what you see in the picture, um, is Galicia, the Galician seas, the Galician estuaries. There, there are uh, more than 3,000 uh, floating farms to harvest mussels. Galicia is the largest world mussel producer. Uh, with 45% of all the European muscles. These, uh, these floating structures simply, they have ropes of 12 meters long where uh, the muscles are growing. They are, be they are made of wood because wood is economic uh, and also is flexible. So it's a, it's a very good material for that. Uh, only, uh, the only problem is that uh, durability is very low. So these structures, which cost around 80,000 euros, uh, have a durability no longer than 10 or 15 years. As uh, you can see here, they bend progressively with the time because in the end these are trees. It's, uh, they are uh, natural. They bend. E every beam has a different stiffness, which is a problem. And after three, four, six years, they start to open also because in some directions, you know, a wood is brittle. Also, after some, some storms, typically in Galicia, this can happen. Uh, an uh, such a big element can break and can go to the coast and can cause a damage. So the only problem was durability. There was no other problem than this. Before us, there were some companies um, la launching innovations to the market. Okay, Innovations where I consider that they were not really focused in listening to the client needs. The client needs the same structure but more durable. And these companies launched uh, innovations that were too disruptive. For example, this one was a structure that can sink, but okay, the client doesn't need this. They simply thought we can protect the structure sinking it. Okay, it's more expensive and it's face, it, I think it's not an adequate way to face the needs. In this case, they made a, a more flexible structure, okay, which adapts better to the waves, but the diameter was too high and didn't fulfill the norms. And also the farmer uh, didn't want to, to harvest in a, such a different uh, typology of structure. So they, they never sold one. In this case, this company uh, used uh, polyethylene beams to solve the problem instead of wood polyethylene because it, it adapts better to the waves. And it's true that they, on, they only changed the material. They didn't change very much the shape. But after three years, the structure was like that. It was too flexible. And if you use a higher amount of material, it is too expensive. So it didn't succeed. This was, these innovations were a problem to us because after some innovations that failed, the, client, the clients didn't want to try new, new, new innovations. They were more reluctant to innovate. However, we designed a UHPC farm we pat and we patented it with four main barriers. First, knowledge barrier, because I didn't know anything about muscles. So it's very difficult to design something if you, if you are not from this sector. I had a mentality barrier because in the, in the ports for the sailors, concrete is not a nice material. They, they have seen many pathologies with concrete, so they don't trust concrete at all. I had a price barrier because we estimated that our product can be 30 or 40 percent more expensive than from our competitors, from the wood structure. And finally, I had a logistic barrier because my factory is 1,000 kilometers from there. So it's a little bit crazy to try to launch a, pro a product there, but we were aware that they had a pr an unsolved problem, and this is the key. They had an unsolved problem, and they spent too much in maintenance. So we started to uh, talk a lot with farmers and assemblers, try to understand their real needs, what do you really need, and to face only these, not seven things, and try to involve them. 
to make them feel part of it. This has a double, uh, a double goal. The first is that I will really understand what they need if we speak a lot. And second is that if I fail, if things don't go well, they will understand me better than if I went by myself. Okay, so they need to be part of this. And if things go good, they will also support my product and go with it. So we designed a structure which goal was to face only the durability problem. So the dimensions of the structures were the same. The, the geometry of the beams were more or, less, more or less the same. And the stiffness was the same. How, we, how did we design it? It's very difficult to calculate. It, it doesn't make sense because the structure is not stiff, uh, is not flexible, it's partially stiff. It's very difficult to calculate a structure like this in the ocean. So what we did is to take wooden beams, because we know that they don't break in the water, to bend them and to design something with the same capacity and the same stiffness. So the, it will behave the same. In the end, we design a beam that, uh, can, uh, that behaves like this. It's, uh, you can see these tests that we did at the Polytechnic University of Valencia. where you can see that, to be concrete, it seems very flexible. This is a pre-stressed beam with a significant pre-stressing. It, it has 50 megapascals under service and uh, submitted to this, it has only micro-cracking, multi-micro cracking, not macro cracking, okay? Well, the weight of the structure was only 15% higher, okay? And the, stu the structure we designed had bolted connections instead of uh, in situ joints like would be typical from precast uh, concrete. So the difference is that it was designed to have a higher lifespan up to uh, 50 years, much lower maintenance costs. It improved the navigation because all the beams are the same. So the response under the waves is much better than with the wood. And uh, it, the change of the beams does not change with the time, logically. However, the price was about uh, 25, 30% higher. Here you can see a test that shows how if we go beyond the service limit state, uh, there is a multi micro cracking response and we, when the beam recovers the original geometry, these, um, these cracks tend to close. In this case, these cracks that you are appreciating, they have a width of no more than 15 microns. Which is, uh, which is great. Even under service, these cracks are not expected to occur. But if there is an incident, if there is an extreme situation, the beam bends a lot and these cracks uh, will not give any durability problem because they are too, too, too small. We also submitted this, uh, these beams connected uh, to a cyclic loading to prove that uh, unlike in the wooden structures, when we bend, when we uh, apply the cyclic loads several times, the response of the connection is the same. In the case of the wood, it's not like that because after certain uh, level, uh, fibers break and the response change. So our material behave better than the wood. Okay, so with it, with, uh, with this, um, we, have, we designed the final element and we really didn't know exactly what we want. Neither the farmers. We proposed them to do two typologies of farms one which is exactly like the wooden one, and the other one is a flat farm because we thought it's safer uh, to walk on the structure. This solution is safer than this one. However, we built both of them, and the farmers preferred the one that they were using. I mean, the, the one that looks extremely similar to the, to the wooden structure. So in the end, this is the solution that we have already in the market. The other one is, to my view, safer, but to their view, and they are the payers, they don't mind. So uh, in the end, we, we, uh, this, this model of a structure, we don't do it anymore. Okay, tomorrow we will speak about uh, building barriers for, for, uh, to protect mm, your, the, the product that you are selling. That's why I'm explaining this here. We are launching a product to the market and I need to build barriers to avoid that other competitors come into the sector to compete with me. So now as a, as, uh, as a company, what kind of barriers are I going to set to avoid that others compete? First, it is very interesting to notice that this is a niche sector. In the end, in this sector, the maximum volume of rafts sold per year is 4 million euros. This is a small amount for a big company.
Okay? This is interesting to me because it's a big sector for a small company, but a small sector for a big company to try to compete with me. But also, we applied for a utility model in 2015. This means that, in theory, no one can build uh, in Spain a floating farm with fiber reinforced concrete. They can build it in another country, but they wouldn't be competitive because they need to bring it to Spain. I can protect in other countries, but it's, ex it's more expensive. I, only, I prefer only to protect in one country. And later, uh, there are other advantages. If I penetrate in the market not having competitors, I am every day more economic, okay? There is a curve of experience and also a volume scale, uh, a scale of volume. So uh, I gain competitive advantages because I acquire volume and I can be cheaper than any other that wants to, start to enter in the market. And finally, finally, I build progressively certain exclusivity because when I speak with the farmers, this is, for example, a meeting where I'm explaining our product, little by little, they perceive me as an, an exclusive company. I have certain prestige, and this is also a barrier, okay? This is how we defend currently our, our situation. Um, well, I don't know how I'm with the time. Okay, there's no time. Well, so how, how did we enter to the market? This is the famous valley of death that uh, we were speaking uh, uh, months ago for the deliverable. But in the end, we had a period of approximately uh, five years between the first idea and selling for first time a product in the market between 2013 and 2019. In this period, we received funding to, um, to launch and improve this product uh, from three different projects, uh, from Selmus Resilience and Open Mode, uh, which invested totally in the development of this product approximately 1.2 million euros. Uh, the return of this investment of the European Commission in our product has already reached approximately 17 million euros between the rafts that we have already sold and the value of the muscles produced uh, with the farms that we have sold. So there is certain uh, already a significant return of this investment, which also is beneficial uh, to meet the, the development goals uh, because uh, ca the carbon footprint of the muscle production is very low. We are producing a, a food in the European Union with a product uh, create, uh, all, all produced in the European Union, and we, we have launched a product that is uh, very respectful with the marine environment. We are replacing wooden structures which are painted with coating on the, on the uh, sea for a material that never needs to be painted with any coating. Okay? Currently, we have already, uh, ins we are going to install uh, in this year uh, already reaching 20,000 square meters floating, okay? Well, this first, in this first stage, in this first project, the goal was to prove to the farmers as soon as possible that the structure is durable because this is the key, okay? To show them that under a storm or with the time, the structure will, will remain not like the other innovations. That's why we accelerated this process in a short project to install farms, which is this project, okay, the Selmus project. Here, we install cameras on the pilots to show to the farmers, yes, under very aggressive environments and very, under significant storms, the product works good, okay? We install five full-scale tests, full-scale elements in five different locations with cameras with a durability remote monitoring, okay? This is not for the client, this is to us to understand if there is corrosion or there is no corrosion. We proved that there is no corrosion. Uh, and also with events and visits to uh, learn from our side and to speak with the farmer. The, with the, uh, we, we were always clear showing to the farmer that we don't know anything about muscles and that we want to listen to them. We know about concrete and they know about muscles, okay? And we did periodic inspections and we, con we continuously improve the product. Did this strategy, this shaping strategy work? It worked. And you can see it nowadays. This is a map of all the structures that we have uh, in Europe. Most of them are in Galicia. And if you check in Galicia, most of them are in this location, in Ogrobe. Ogrobe is the place where we installed the two first pilots. So there where we installed the first farms, is where we have more farms. Why? 
because the farmers have seen have seen that after three, four, five, seven years, the structures are still there. So with the pass of the time, they have really seen the durability. This is the best way to show durability with a real example uh, and with the time. Okay. After this, now that we are already in the market, what we are trying to do, as you see here, we are very localized in a single product and in Galicia, what we are trying to do is to uh, diversify. Diversify by product and diversify uh, uh, by market. Or in other, in other words, we adapt the product to diversify by market. What we have done? Well, these are, this is the same raft, but it's submersible. Why? To face uh, the, north, the northern countries. Okay, this one is installed in, the, in, in Denmark, in the Northern Sea, and in winter it sinks to avoid the ice. Okay, this is an adaptation of the product to be able to sell there, otherwise I cannot sell there. This is a connectable structure, it's the same raft, but we divided it in lengths of 12 meters and we connect it on the water. Why? Because then I can export to Morocco. Otherwise, the costs are too high because the beams have 27 meters of length. Then what I do is to split it in 12 meters elements so I can transport it, I can transport it in, 40, in, in 40 inches containers. Okay? This is an, a product adaptation to reach markets beyond. In this case, this is, a, this is an element uh, a, a small module that we sell that we sold in Croatia in Montenegro. Why? Because the farmers do not need a larger element like in Galicia. This is an example also of product adaptation in Galicia. We have done a simpler and a more economic raft, simply reducing the number of beams. Why? Because in the internal waters where there are no significant waves, uh, we were not competitive with the wood, and there we can afford, we can accept to have a simpler element. So we have reduced the number of beams, then we don't need such a big floater, which is very positive because the price of the steel is very high, and now we are competitive in this market. It's an example of adaptation of product to uh, diversify the segment of the client. This was done in the, project, in the project open mode. And the final pilot that we did, the final, or let's say the most dramatic change of the product to uh, reach new markets, was the idea of trying to transfer technology from, from this sector of the aquaculture to the floating photovoltaics. Okay, you know, maybe you know this, but uh, there is an increasing uh, demand of floating uh, photovoltaic uh, plants, uh, both in, well, generally in dams and internal waters, and progressively more in offshore waters. So we thought, okay, in theory, if you take this diagram, in, in the water, you need, uh, there, is, there is potential corrosion, so you need durability. And if you have something that needs to float, you need lightness. So in, possibly with UHPC, we can do something in the floating offshore sector. And uh, we did it. We did this first test to check if it works or not. Let me see if it works. Okay, and we did a small pilot. And we didn't know exactly why we did it. I mean, uh, we knew it was not competitive in costs. This is, a, this is a floater of UHPC instead of being a floater of plastic. This is not competitive in costs compared with uh, plastics, but we, we wanted to explore it, okay? And you can see, this is a work done uh, together with Tecnalia. We, during six months, we proved that it works and that UHPC is very interesting for that. And then what we did was to show it around the world that, it, that there, are, there are new possibilities with this material in this sector. And then in one of these talks, we, meet, we met Isi Genere, which needed to build a very significant floating uh, plant, photovoltaic plant in Portugal for the brand EDP. And they thought, okay, if this makes sense, would you like to design a perimetral pontoon or stiffener Later I will explain why, why with UHPC for a five megawatts floating PV plant. So they requested this to us and we explored if it makes sense. Uh, this application was uh, to be done in Alkeva Dam, which is the largest uh, dam in the European Union and for the largest floating PV plant that was going to be built uh, in, in Europe and that has already been built with uh, 33,000 square meters. 
what is the goal of this application? They didn't want that we build a thousand of floaters of UHPC because it doesn't make sense. The goal is normally in floating PV, if you are using a small, if you install it in a small lake or in a closed area like this application, you can install it with plastic floaters, like you can see in the left picture. But if you go to a significant dam, to a large dam, here you are going to have winds, currents. You are going to have, uh, in this case, a maximum uh, height of wave of 1.5 meters. And there, the plastic uh, cannot carry, the, the, the connection between the plastic floaters cannot carry the loads. So what they propose is to build a perimetral pontoon that pro protects all the floaters from this. So in the end, what we are going to build is the frame. Also, and this is the most relevant, the water depth here is more than 70 meters. If you don't have a stiffener, a perimetral stiffener, then you spend uh, a significant amount of money in moorings. So what we build is this perimetral pontoon stiffener to reduce the number of mo moorings and do it economically viable, okay? The initial proposal was made with ordinary concrete, okay? So we thought about a design and we proposed a design of pontoons with a, a, with a length of approxi approximately 13 meters and which uh, had uh, the, the following achievements. The transportation costs were divided by four compared to ordinary concrete because it was four times lighter, okay? So much more economic. The, f the thickness of the element is lower so the freeboard is lower and the draft is lower. This means that the hydrodynamic forces and aerodynamic forces of the wind are lower. And with these savings, it was the most economic option. And when it is the most economic option, then everything goes very fast, okay? Here, we don't need to prove the durability. I know it's more durable, but they don't mind. Simply, it is the most economic option. So we are going to do it right now. And that was the, that was the proposal. Also with our proposal, there was less visual intrusion because it's closer to the water. We use less resources and we proposed scr screwed connections like in the raft uh, because then it's easy to uh, connect and to disconnect, okay? We launched a utility model together, uh, uh, my company and Easy Genere, uh, also in Spain, and we have 12 months to extend it to other countries and possibly we will do it. As in the case of the rafts, we cannot simply build it and install it. Uh, it's always very interesting to do a full scale test to verify the most critical things. So we did a bending test, which was obvious because we know the capacity, but what we really cared is the bending capacity of the connection. So it is an, this is an example in the laboratory of the connection test done to uh, two real elements. It's a non-destructive element. These elements were later installed in the, in the structure. Okay, you can see here an example. This is in the building process, okay? You, don't, you cannot see yet here the plastic floaters, but you can see the efficiency of this solution, how it really calms the, wa the waves, okay? So uh, it, is, it is working as expected. You can see here a few pictures of the pontoons stored and uh, how is the connection between these pontoons and the, and the plastic, plastic floaters. And you can see here the final, the final result of these pontoons stiffeners. You can see there here in red and the, the final uh, 33,000 square meters. And this is the floating substation, which uh, now you will see. It was also done with UHPC because they needed to carry 28 tons of the, uh, of the, the, subest the substation, uh, this container, which contains the cables, substation, and so on. And they needed a high bending capacity and also an improved fire strength. Yeah, so this element was also done with UHPC. These are some uh, images of the, uh, of the application. In this part of the dam, the wind and the current and the waves are significant, but the structure is here because then you reduce the connection costs to send the electricity from uh, this element to the, uh, to the part of the dam where the electricity can be captured. You can see here a small video in YouTube this, this movement is very difficult if you don't have a perimetral stiffener to move all the structure at the same time. So it has also advantages to build the final solution.
So to conclude, uh, as you can, as you, as I have already mentioned, there are some similarities, many similarities, between the UHPC technology and the self-healing technology, in the sense that both have new functionalities that may add value in sectors beyond construction. We have seen examples in aquaculture and in uh, renewable energies, but you may find your own application in self-healing. Uh, these are quite unknown in the construction, which is a very conservative sector. So you require, uh, uh, the technologies require active efforts from your side to promote them and to explain the real functionalities. Both require a shaping a strategy from your side. I mean, you need to build the sector. You will not enter simply in a sector. You need to build the demand. And as in, uh, uh, as in UHPC, self-healing value is maybe, it's only appreciated at long term, which is particularly complex. So my tips, are, and I simply remind this because I have already mentioned that, is that you try to think out the box, okay? Don't focus in the construction sector. Try to go beyond. Don't be afraid of thinking silly things. Th think silly things because after 10 or 20 of them, one will be brilliant, okay? Uh, you should compete by price or solve a problem. It's very difficult to sell something if you don't use one of these two strategies. If you are not solving a problem, you cannot be more expensive than the alternatives. Otherwise, you will not sell, okay? Be brave being the first. So be brave shaping a sector. And, and also try to find brave people. The first people that tried these applications, they were very brave because they are paying for something that is for sure going to be worse than the second one that, that we do. However, they love the world and they pay and they say, okay, I will have the first. It will not be the best, but I will have the first. You need to find these people, these innovation patrons. And also I recommend you to do full scale test before the first application. It's important that you try to do your first real application as soon as possible, because this is what will be the beginning of proving the durability. However, don't accelerate it too much, because if you make a big mistake in this full scale test, you will have no other choice. If our floating platforms uh, sink, <laughs> sink in the sea, in the first real test, I will have no choice. Now, after 30 structures, if one sinks, it's not a problem, but the first can never sink, okay? So you need to meet an equilibrium between um, be fast and do your first application due to this reason. And finally, as I said, involve the testers and the future clients, because if things don't go perfect, then they will really be, and they, they will understand you, okay? They will not criticize, criticize you that much. And that's it.